I would have looked for a part-time job in a record shop or something because mm. I was fanatical about music. Mm. Um, but I knew that Richard had started this magazine called Student. I'd never met him or anything. Quite, he's a second cousin. And when I arrived in England, I was staying with my aunt and I met his parents. And they were telling me about the, about the uh, mail order spin-off from Student Magazine. And they said, oh, go and see Ricky. And uh, Monday morning went out to get a job and I went to the Oxford Street shop, which hadn't actually opened. It was 24 Oxford Street, above a shoe shop. And there he was sitting behind a desk with his feet up. And I, I said, I'm your cousin. And he said, really? I didn't know I had any cousins in South Africa. <laughs> so um, I chatted. He took me out to lunch. And um, he said, when do you want to start? And I said, well, tomorrow. So I did. I'd collate an order from each of the dis distributing companies. It wasn't as simple as all that because Richard had terrible pro problems with um, cash flow. <coughs> and so we were often on stop and some people objected to the fact that we were discounting records. We were the only people doing it because prior to that it had been illegal and they'd, it was now legal but no one reacted. They all thought it would be chaos with, you know, like America which was seen as just, you know, an anarchic mayhem. But Steve Lewis was um, compiling the the catalogue, because we published a catalogue, we'd send it out to people, and doing the ad, you know, the full page ad in Melody Maker. With all, in all the, we had all the categories and different types of stuff. And that was good fun, because if you put a, a record in there, you got orders for it. Doesn't matter what it was. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. They trusted us so uh, profoundly. <laughs> and so Steve actually put in Steve Lewis's greatest hits, and he got an order for it. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it because I'd get orders for re obscure records that either had never been released in Britain or were deleted and then I'd have to try and find them because that gave us a real edge if we could sell those uh, records. And the famous one I w always talk about was the Van de Graaff Generator who obviously we sold their current Charisma albums but their first album was on Mercury and had only been released in America and it was called Aerosol Grey Machine. And we used to get people writing in saying, can you get us an aerosol great machine? And we would allow people, and people would send money, so we would have the money. And then the stack of orders in this, you know, little... Uh, when it got to about 70, you realised, boy, we, re we really ought to get some of these records. All right back to everyone and say, look, can't, can't do it. And I managed to find a cutout guy in Philadelphia, who I later discovered used to do all his business armed. <laughs> but he found some. You know, there was American cutouts with a mm. hole through the yeah. corner. And I think we got 130 yeah. of them. So that's the first thing I did when I started there in the early 71, is to sort of w work out ways of importing records. And then we started doing importing records that were, were going to come out in England, but where there was a time lag. So we could advertise the new Joni Mitchell album or the new um, Mother's Invention album and sell hundreds of copies at import prices. I mean, the day I started, there was actually a postal strike on so that which went on for about six weeks, so we couldn't receive, we, we weren't receiving any money, we couldn't send any money records out. So the whole place was just piling up with, <coughs> and then grinding to a halt. And so the shop opened luckily, and so that we had some money coming in. But the, the idea was to run the mail order as a kind of flagship loss leader, because it was hard to make money discounting the way we, we were, um, and have the shops uh, hopefully make money. As far as I know, we never made any money in retail in the early years at all. The only way that we survived was by constantly expanding. And um, it wasn't until we started the record label that Virgin became a bit more financially stable because the record company made money. But the re retail was always losing money.